next case to come before the court is State versus Ramsey. Please, the court. Good morning. I'm going to reserve some time. Yes, Your Honor. I'd like, on behalf of the appellant, I'd like to reserve five minutes. Thank you. Well, good morning. On behalf of the appellant, my name is David Sheldon, and uh, I represent GR in this case. Uh, may it please the court. I've identified uh, three assignments of error in this particular case uh, with respect to the sentencing of Gavin, Gavin, or GR to life without the possibility of parole. First of all, I'd like to address uh, assignment of error number two that I raised in my brief first, and that is specifically the trial court's failure to consider youth as a mitigating factor uh, in its analysis of the aggravating circumstances in this case, and whether or not youth was considered as a mitigating factor. Um, and and my, my specific issue is when the trial court merely mentions a juvenile's age during sentencing but does not certainly consider it as a factor, when it gets life without a parole, does the trial court run a foul, run a foul of State versus Law 138 House State 3rd 478, which mandates that the trial court consider the offender's youth as a separate mitigating factor. Uh, specifically, if the court was to look at the transcript in this case, on page 208, the court began its mitigation analysis. It stated on the top of page 28, a mitigation defendant submits the opinion of Dr. Bregan, who, and the uh, court goes on to analyze Dr. Bregan's opinion. However, in its mitigation analysis, never considers or mentions youth in mitigation of, of punishment in this case, which runs a follow of state versus long. And in long, uh, the court reversed the trial court sentence because the court did not mention youth, number one. And number two, there was no way for the court to determine in long what consideration, if any, the court gave uh, to the uh, appellant's age in that case as a mitigating factor. In, uh, I'd like to point out also, uh, in uh, specifically in long, quote, although Miller does not require that specific findings be made on the record, it does mandate that a trial court consider as mitigating the offender's youth and its attendant characteristics before imposing a sentence of life without parole. For juveniles like Long, a sentence of life without parole is the equivalent of the death penalty. As such, it is not to be imposed lightly, for as, as the juvenile matures into adulthood and may become amenable to rehabilitation, the sentence completely forecloses that possibility. Close quote. And that was Long cited Miller at 132 Supreme Court at 2463. Further on in Long, the court went on to talk about the progeny that preceded its case. Quote, the United States Supreme Court has indicated Roper, Graham, and Miller that juveniles who commit criminal offenses are not as culpable for their acts as adults are and are more amenable to reform. We agree with this sentiment in Henry CP 131 Ohio State 3rd 513. Miller did not go so far as to bar courts from imposing a sentence of life without the possibility of parole on a juvenile. Yet, because of the severity of the, that penalty, and because youth and its attendant circumstances are strong mitigating factors, that sentence should rarely be imposed on juveniles. And that was long, quoting Miller, at 132 Supreme Court 2469. The Long Court went on to state, quote, in this case, the trial court must consider Long's youth 
as a mitigating factor before determining whether aggravating factors outweigh it. We therefore reverse the judgment of the Court of Appeals and remand the cause to the trial court for resentencing, close quote. In this case, we don't have that. We have the court beginning its mitigation analysis on page 208 of the transcript of a sentencing hearing with no mention of youth or consideration of GR's youth as a mitigating factor in its sentence of life without parole. So because of that direct violation of Long and its failure to consider youth as a mitigating factor, uh, the appellant in this case respectfully requests that the court reverse and remand this matter for resentencing to conform to the specific mandates of Long, not only to consider youth as a mitigating factor, but also the intended circumstances of the case in this particular case. I think uh, Judge Schaefer has a question for you. I noticed that you, you said that the mitigation analysis started on page 208 of the transcript, but the state cited to pages uh, 204 to 206 of the transcript where the trial court did address his age. Can you explain why that's not sufficient? On pages 204, Your Honor, I think there were lip service paid to the issue of youth, if I recall from my reading of the transcript. Um, on page 204, the in fact, the court began uh, citing Long, as well as uh, the 9th District's case in State versus Rafferty, It basically states on the bottom of 204, quote, in determining the defendant's sentence, the court is to consider his age, taking into consideration the reckless nature of youth and the impetuousness of youth, together with the age of the offender and the nature of the crimes. The question is whether the defendant can be redeemed at the time of sentencing. Can he deemed at the time of sentence to be irreparably corrupt beyond redemption and thus unfit ever to re-enter re society, notwithstanding the diminished culpability and greater prospects for reform that ordinarily distinguish juveniles from adults? In this matter, the court finds this was not a crime of passion, but was a prey that premeditated. The crime was of a nature not previously seen in this community. Period. That's 204, 205. So there was lip service paid to youth. However, there was no analysis of what impact or consideration the court gave to his youth. Specifically, he was, six, he was 16 shortly before these crimes were committed. He turned 17 right before these crimes were committed. And what affects his youth at all had in way against any aggravating circumstances in this case. That so, analysis was not done. It sounds to me, though, like you're saying that the court does need to make findings or uh, does need to do reasoning on the record for making findings in regard to this. And I think the case law says the opposite, right? Well, the case law says that the sport, court must specifically consider youth and its attendant circumstances in reaching a decision of imposing life without parole. In Long, there was a, a, a long discussion by the judge, even after, after was re, what came back for resentencing, and went up the second time, there was a long discussion about his consideration of youth, how much weight he placed on youth, the attendant circumstances of the individual's youth in that particular case. He made a very good record, so it wouldn't be reversed again by the House Supreme Court. Uh, that does not occur here. And the attendant circumstances are not even mentioned in this case. The attendant circumstances were that Gavin Ramsey, although he committed these uh, heinous crimes, there was a, a lot of evidence that he was under the influence of Zoloft, uh, that Zoloft increased his manic bipolar episodes in this case, added to uh, his uh, impulsivity, and uh, led, unfortunately, to this bizarre act uh, on, on this elderly woman. So there were a lot of attendant circumstances. His youth, in terms of growing up, um, what occurred, uh, he had febrile seizures when he was young. This was all brought out, brought out by counsel at the time of sentencing, which was not, very, was not really considered by the trial court in its analysis as a mitigating factor. Um, I also pointed out, too, um, in, in the case law that uh, I mentioned that uh, in Miller, the United States Co uh, Supreme Court, held that imposition of mandatory life without parole sentences for juvenile violates the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishments. The court discussed its previous cases that established that children are constitutionally different from adults for purposes of sentencing. And it stated, first, children have a lack of maturity and an under, underdeveloped sense of responsibility, leading to recklessness, impulsivity, and heedless risk-taking. 
Second, children are more vulnerable to negative influences and outside pressures, including from their family and peers. They have limited control over their own environment and lack the ability to extricate themselves from the horrific crime-producing settings. And third, a child's character is not as well formed as an adult's. His traits are less fixed and his actions less likely to be evidence of irretrievable depravity. That Counsel, was, though, with the Zoloft, for instance, that you're talking about, the, the evidence, as I understand, was that he had written in a, a journal or a notebook or something that he wanted to kill before he was taken to Zoloft. Yeah, he was talking about writing about serial murderers, mm -hmm. and he was fantasizing. About killing somebody. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. That occurred before uh, the Zoloft was prescribed. But Dr. Bregan's opinion is it's akin to throwing gasoline on a fire. Here you have an individual who is under the age of majority who specifically should not be given Zoloft as an antidepressant. It's specifically prohibited by the medical literature. No warnings were given to his mother about the violent propensities that can occur. Dr. Bregan did several studies showing a direct and causal link between Zoloft increasing manic episodes and psychotic episodes in juveniles. I want to warn you, you're in the rebellion. Your, your Honors, I would also ask the court uh, to consider, I, I didn't really talk about it much, but the issue of merger I think is a real big issue in this case because these were maximum consecutive sentences. Aggravated murder and aggravated burglary were committed with the same animus in this case. He was inside the apartment and he reacted, that is GR reacted to the elderly woman waking up and grabbing the phone to make a phone call. It was at that point that he reacted and grabbed her and choked her to death. So therefore, the physical harm that was caused during the commission of the aggravated burglary also called, caused the death of, of uh, the other woman in this case. So that is a murder. Kidnapping also, the restraint on Miss, or, or on the elderly woman in this case, came about the same time that he choked her and caused her death. That was also part and parcel of the aggravated murder and aggravated burglary occurring at the same time. And for those reasons, I'm asking the court to reverse and remand in order that the court merge those sentences uh, on all three of those counts in this particular case. Thank, Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. I'm Vince Bellucci with the Medina County Prosecutor's Office for the Appellee of the State of Ohio. Uh, and I'll start with the uh, assignment of error uh, two, which was addressed uh, first by Mr. Sheldon. Uh, the argument that the trial court did not uh, properly consider Mr. Ramsey's uh, age as a mitigating factor, as it was required to do, we know, under the, uh, under the Long case. That, that is true. Um, <clears throat> the trial court did consider uh, Ramsey's age at length. On the record before it sentenced Ramsey, it actually held an entire uh, hearing, uh, a, a sentencing uh, hearing in which there was testimony taken. This was a, this was a very long hearing that took uh, several, several hours. Uh, and uh, the court specifically noted, first of all, as Mr. Sheldon mentioned, that, that Ramsey was 17 years old at the time of the incident. Um, well, I think court, some a little less than 17, right? I, I believe he was, uh, I believe he was 17 yeah. at the time of the incident. Um, the trial court then stated on the record, uh, quote, and this is from pages uh, 204 to 206 of, of the transcript. In determining the defendant's sentence, the court is to consider his age, taking into consideration the reckless nature of youth and the impetuousness of youth together with the age of the offender and the nature of the crime. The question is whether the defendant can be redeemed at the time of sentencing, can be deemed at the time of sentencing to be irreparably corrupt, beyond redemption, and thus unfit ever to re-enter society, notwithstanding the diminished culpability and greater prospects for reform that ordinarily distinguish juveniles from adults. If that's not considering uh, Ramsey's age, I'm not sure what would be. Uh, that, that's not lip service. Uh, that's, that's a, and, and there's... Uh, Nothing, there's no law out there that says that, that something like that is not sufficient, but that wasn't the last time it was even uh, addressed by, by the court. Um, ultimately, the court said uh, when it sentenced Ramsey, uh, later on in the transcript at, at 2.11, it states, 
Uh, the court finds the defendant to be irreparably corrupt beyond redemption and thus unfit to ever re-enter society, notwithstanding the diminished culpability and greater prospects for reform that ordinarily distinguish juveniles from adults. So, so they reference it, uh, so the court references it uh, once again. Um, counsel, just to throw a complete wrench in the works here, can you discuss for a moment this court's authority to review a life sentence on the ag murder charge? I don't think it has any. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to start with the assignment of error two first, but, but that's assignment of error one is challenging the life sentence itself, and I don't think uh, this court even has jurisdiction to do that under uh, 2953-08-D3, which states that, uh, quote, a sentence imposed for aggravated murder or murder pursuant to sections 2929-02 to 2929-06 of the revised code is not subject to review under this section. So I think that's, that's about as clear as it gets. Uh, I, I don't think this court can uh, have as authority to, to, uh, to overturn or even review uh, the life sentence without parole. Uh, this court uh, did recently reaffirm that in the McCarley, ca in the McCarley case from, from 2018. That's 2018 Ohio uh, 4685. Not even under the Eighth Amendment of parole and unusual punishment? Well, I, I suppose it, it says it cannot be reviewed under that statute, uh, stat statutorily. Right. Now that is now the Eighth Amendment could be something different entirely. I I, I will say that, but um, under the normal ways to, re to review a, a sentence, uh, you know, um, twenty nine fifty three oh eight, it cannot uh, be reviewed. Uh, now, um, sentence of, of life in prison without parole was within the statutory range. It was not an abuse of discretion. It would have to be an abuse of discretion if it was not. Um, Outside of the consideration of youth that, that, was, that was mentioned uh, for a juvenile, uh, the trial court has discretion to state its own reasons uh, for its sentence. And the trial court gave many on the record, uh, to say the least. Uh, as the trial court uh, said, this crime was of a nature not ever before seen in this community. And, and that is true. Uh, this was not a crime of passion. This was premeditated. The trial court accurately described this crime as depraved. Uh, I'll, I'll just get into just some of the facts here. Uh, Ramsey snuck out of his house in the early morning hours of, of April 6, 2018, so that he could act out his uh, long-standing desire to kill. Ramsey carried gloves with him to the crime scene, which was the home of a 98-year-old woman located just a few houses away from his own house. Uh, Ramsey had known uh, the victim previously, and she was Ramsey's uh, intended target, not a, not a random victim. Ramsey uh, stalked his victim while she slept on her couch and recorded video of her both uh, before and after he murdered her. Uh, Ramsey told Dr. Jones from the psychodiagnostic clinic exactly what he did uh, for her report. Uh, Ramsey stated that he bumped into something which made a noise and woke, woke uh, the victim up. When the victim went for her phone, presumably to call police, Ramsey stated that he struggled with the victim to get the phone from her. Ramsey stated that uh, the victim was yelling, and so he strangled her. But, but Ramsey wasn't done after the murder, not by a long shot. Uh, Ramsey spent another whole hour in the victim's home acting out his deviant sexual fantasies on the victim's corpse. And we know exactly what Ramsey did because he took the time to record video and take photos of these heinous acts on his cell phone. Uh, we see a gloved hand around the victim's throat. We see a gloved hand cupping the victim's bare breast. We see Ramsey holding the victim's hand up to his penis and using the victim's hand to masturbate. We see Ramsey insert his finger into the victim's vagina. There's a photo of the victim lying on her back, nude, with her legs propped up, exposing her uh, vaginal and anal areas with the gloved hand uh, holding her buttocks. We know that Miss Douglas' uh, nude body was found days later, uh, stuffed into a small closet, 
hidden behind several items, which made it difficult to find her initially. Um, Dr. Lynn Luna Jones of the uh, Psychodiagnostic Clinic in Akron did a report that contained an incredible amount of compelling information that I hope this court uh, reviews uh, very thoroughly and carefully. And none of that information is, is favorable to Ramsey. Uh, in fact, I make the comment in my brief that it would be hard to imagine a more disturbing psychological report than what the trial court had in front of it in this case. Um, and, and I'll just read some of the trial court's summary of Dr. Jones's report because I think it's important. Uh, the, the defendant displays a repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others and major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated. He has displayed aggression to people, destruction of property, deceitfulness, and theft. He has a general lack of concern about the negative consequences of his actions. He lacks empathy for others and is more concerned about the effects of his actions on himself rather than the effects on others. It was further determined that the defendant appears to be sexually aroused from the physical and or psychological suffering of others. He has acted on those sexual urges with a non-consenting person. The defendant was 17 years, years of age at the time of the incident. He began showing significant behavioral issues around 10 years of age in March of 2011. He had been uh, chasing his siblings with, with knives. There was concern of serious harm to others. It is noted that the defendant's aggressive behaviors have escalated significantly over the past year, and he's become preoccupied by violent fantasies, including researching serial killers. When arrested, he told the police he did not believe he would have been able to change on his own and agreed that he would likely kill more people. He went from mischief and theft from stores or cars face-to-face -face robbery from grown men, burglary, and murder. He lacks remorse for his behavior. He is criminally sophisticated. He displays a callous disregard for the harm he causes others. He does not appear to be motivated to change his behavior. The defendant displays deviant sexual behavior. He views pornography with some violent content. His journal reflects fantasies of raping others. He acted on these sadistic sexual urges at the time of the offense charged. And, and it goes on like that. But um, in terms of the Zoloft, uh, at the sentencing hearing, instead of taking responsibility for his actions, Ramsey attempted to blame his actions on the antidepressant medication Zoloft, widely taken medication. Uh, over the state's objection, Ramsey uh, submitted the report of Dr. Peter Bregan, who utilized court funds to hire. In that report, when Ramsey was asked if he was feeling the effects of Zoloft during the uh, period in question, or around the time of the murder, he told Dr. Bregan that he was so hopped up on alcohol and marijuana, he couldn't tell if the Zoloft had any effect on it. Uh, Ramsey admitted during this time he was drinking a fifth of alcohol per day, morning and night. He was smoking three marijuana cigarettes every day. As Judge Carr mentioned, he wrote all these disturbing things in his journal uh, before he ever took Zoloft. He was, he was writing all these things uh, about wanting to kill people and serial killers and all these things, raping people. Uh, given these facts, it's, it's not surprising that Ramsey's Zoloft excuse uh, rang hollow with the trial court. Uh, he was essentially trying to admit a, a diminished capacity defense during sentencing, which, which never would have been admissible at trial because we know diminished capacity is not, not allowed in Ohio. Uh, on the merger issue, I'll just briefly say that that is usually a de novo review, but in this case, it's plain error, at least on the kidnapping and, and ag murder, because that wasn't raised at all uh, below. There was a brief argument made by Ramsey uh, in, in his sentencing memorandum that the ag murder and ag burglary should merge. But at the sentencing hearing itself, Ramsey did not argue for merger at all. The prosecutor, on the other hand, did state on the record that none of the counts should merge. Uh, as I mentioned, Ramsey himself described the restraint of Miss Douglas as a struggle in which he was trying to get Miss Douglas's phone away from her. Ramsey stated that Miss Douglas was, was yelling during this struggle. She was being held against her will. That kidnapping subjected the 98-year-old victim 
uh, to a substantial increase in harm separate from uh, the aggravated murder, which came later as a result of uh, separate conduct, this strangulation. Uh, Ramsey committed the ag burglary uh, the moment he inflicted or even attempted to inflict the slightest physical harm on his victim uh, after trespassing in her home, of course, with, with purpose to commit a criminal offense. Uh, the many injuries that Ramsey inflicted on Miss Douglas uh, included not only the massive injuries to her neck as the result of the uh, strangulation, but there were also defensive wounds on Miss Douglas's hands and, and arms uh, that, that are indicative of a physical uh, struggle uh, prior to the actual strangulation which, which killed her. Uh, there were also serious injuries to, to, the, uh, to the victim's face, her mouth, her nose. Uh, so there's evidence that uh, there was serious physical harm done to uh, Miss Douglas, I'm sorry, the, the victim even before the murder occurred. So these are separate, uh, these are separate acts. I should also say that there's, uh, there's plenty of case law out there that talks about the, uh, the predicate offenses for, for aggravated murder do not merge into the aggravated murder. That is, that is well established uh, that, that those don't merge. Now under the, uh, under the new test, the, the rough test, you, you do have to consider the conduct of the of the defendant when, when determining whether something is, is allied in allied offenses. It's not simply just a legal analysis anymore. That can be difficult, however, based on a, on a record in a case like this where you've got a plea, you didn't have a full trial. But, uh, but I would say that there are, there are actually quite a few facts in terms of what happened and facts out of Ramsey's own mouth about what, what happened that he told uh, Dr. Jones uh, in a lot of detail uh, exactly what he did. Uh, so, I think there is enough to say uh, that a, a merger analysis was not necessary in this case. It was uh, it, it, for the trial court to, uh, there wasn't anything before the court to justify a, a merger analysis. Uh, it, cer it certainly was not raised by the defense, as I said. Um, how much time do I have? You're at 18 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> All right, we'll take the matter under. I mean, thank you for the presentation. Just ask this court to affirm the judgment of the trial court. Thank you. Almost forgot about your rebuttal. <laughs> thank you. Please you support. have three and a half minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, addressing Judge Hensel's question about reviewability, yes, this case is subject to review. Mr. Vigalucci points out a statute which does not bear on this. This is a juvenile. Uh, individual that was sentenced to life without parole, all of the case law uh, dealing with reviewability of a life without parole sentence for juveniles came down in my brief, and I cited all the cases beginning with Graham, then Miller, then Roper, then Montgomery. All of those cases deal with the reviewability of a site, sentence of life without parole under the 8th and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution. So no, 2953-08. Uh, yes, it does say it's not reviewable for adult offenders. Uh, for juvenile offenders, yes, it is reviewable. The sentence is reviewable in this case. In most cases, reviewed sentences of life without parole, uh, mandatory life without parole, uh, death sentence for juveniles, which we all know was overturned and uh, juveniles can't be sentenced to death. But all of those cases allow for reviewability by this court of life sentences without parole. With respect to the issue of Merger in this particular case, uh, Mr. Viglucci apparently wants a, a visceral reaction from this court on the gruesomeness of this crime. Uh, that's not what we're here for, as we all know. And as I cited in my brief, uh, in this particular case, the gruesomeness of a crime is not sufficient to demonstrate that a juvenile offender is beyond redemption. Under Adams versus Alabama, 136 Supreme Court, 19, or 1796, 2016 case. So just because this was not seen before in this community, this type of crime, doesn't mean this individual is incapable of redemption. All the cases I cited in my brief to distinguish this case from those cases, those cases are much more heinous than this case. State versus Rafferty was a multiple killing. State versus Long was a multiple killing. The, the um, I think it was the Rafferty case, uh, or I could be wrong on that, it might be, uh, 
long where they lured the uh, three or the four victims into the woods and the juvenile helped uh, bring them there to the woods, dug the holes for the bodies. One individual escaped. Those, those were three individuals that were murdered in that case and all through prior calculation design and the juvenile helping set up all these murders. He knew what was happening, clearly distinguishable from this case. Um, in Long, uh, two of the other co-defendants killed two persons in two separate sh shootings. The juvenile previously been convicted of a felony of violence and was therefore prohibited from pressing, uh, possessing a firearm. He was 17 year olds, just shy of his 18th birthday. In this particular case, Gavin Ramsey was never adjudicated for any crime of violence before the commission of this, this crime. Yes, he was being investigated for other crimes. Interesting enough, those all crimes were all occurring in the three months leading up to uh, the death of this elderly woman when he was prescribed Zola. Interestingly, when he goes into the detention center and his mom discovers that Zoloft should not be prescribed to juveniles and asks that they stop giving him Zoloft, his total mood and everything changes. He's uh, talking to the counselor there, the social worker in jail, how he's doing better. She'd never seen him like that before in her August visit. Uh, is it just coincidental when he's taking off Zoloft, he's not committing any crimes of violence in the detention center, he's not co committing any crimes of violence in the uh, jail when he's transferred to jail after he pleads no contest to these charges. Is that just coincidental that he's all of a sudden doing better? He's not committing any crimes of violence and he's improving in his of course, demeanor? Of course, at the same time, he also was reading the book by the expert that testified about the effects of Zoloft. Uh, that's true. He did, have, he did have access to the book uh, uh, written by Dr. Bregan. Uh, that's for the court to weigh in this particular case, but he's also indicating to uh, the social worker that he's doing better, that he wants to educate uh, prisoners, he wants to get a college degree, et cetera, et cetera. So the court is saying this is the rarest of juvenile cases where this individual is incapable of redemption. I disagree. Those cases are already established that I distinguished in my brief. Counsel, you're out of time. Thank you. Uh, the appellate respectfully requests that this honorable court reverse the decision of, of the trial court and demand this for resentencing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation. The court will take the matter under advisement, issue a written opinion, and also release it on our website. Thank you.